So I want to give you just a little bit of background about what this presentation is about and what I what I want to share with you in the next uh, few minutes that we have together here. Um, I review papers for, for many of your students, for lots of students at ASAP, and for the students that I teach in writing courses too. Uh, and it's it's been in the three and a half years that I've been with CUCA, it's been multiple or a few thousand papers that I've reviewed for the college. So I've I've had lots of practice, and one of the things that I've I've learned over that all that practice is that um, my feedback, the feedback that I give to students on, especially on their writing, as I, I do teach writing, and of course I'm helping them with their writing in my role as the director of the Writing Support Center, my feedback has changed quite a bit uh, over the years. Um, even going back to before I was a, a teacher at CUCA, I had taught for many years prior to that as well. And my feedback has evolved. And that's that's one of the points that I, I think uh, is worth presenting and, and stressing, that uh, our feedback is and should change uh, quite a bit um, as we as we move across our, our teaching careers. I remember when I first uh, interviewed for a uh, higher education teaching position at my previous employer, uh, it was the first time that I was going to be uh, teaching writing and evaluating students for grades. I had worked in an ESL setting prior to that for uh, many years, half dozen, eight years, I think it was. Uh, and we didn't give grades uh, to our students. Uh, we gave basically pass fail. Did you learn something? Can you move on to the next level? So we weren't giving A, B, C, D, E, excuse me, no E in there, but A, B, C, D, and F. Uh, and so I asked during my interview, I asked uh, the tenured professor who had been with the institution for about 15 years at that point, you know, how do you how do you grade students? This is going to be new to me, and I, I don't really know where to begin or what to do. And she said, yeah, that's that's a good question. I, I really don't have an answer to it myself. I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, wasn't an answer that helped me all that much at the time, but thinking back on it, it is it is actually a pretty helpful thing to to keep in mind that um, we're not going to nail it. We're not going to just have it all down. It's something that we do have to continue working on and, and growing at, just as our students are trying to grow in the classroom as well. So all that said, uh, I'd like to jump into this presentation, which is about how to give our students effective feedback. Um, most of the examples that you'll see here, all of the examples you'll see here in this presentation that I'm giving are done in an online for or a digital format. Um, I review students' papers on, on their Word documents, uh, and I <clears throat> find that to be a pretty effective way to review students' documents. Um, but of course, this, these lessons do apply to working with pens and paper uh, as well. Um, so, jumping in. Effective feedback. I think it's important before we get too much further along in our presentation to examine what that means in the first place. And I, I would start by saying that effective feedback is something that promotes learning. Um, we promote learning by encouraging our students to both think critically and to act. Um, the key idea here, with the, the first bullet point anyway, is is that we don't we don't want to just give our students the answers. We want to make our students arrive at these answers themselves. It's that that journey that they take to get to the answer that makes it possible for them to to internalize this information. If we just hand it over to them, it's it's something that's quite likely just going to pass right on out the other side. Um, so. And that's the first piece is getting our students to, to actually engage in the thought process that that moves this forward for them, something that they can actually internalize. And again, we do this by asking questions and providing instructions rather than fixing mistakes and giving answers to our students. Um, and then the other piece of that is getting our students to act. Um, it's one thing to get the student to think about it. It's a, a positive thing to get the student to think about how he or she might improve the writing that they have there on the page. But if they don't actually have to do something with that paper, if they don't actually have to do something with that feedback or advice that you've given, then they're not likely to remember it. So the, the critical thinking is a, a big part of that, but uh, just as important is that they actually have a chance to practice it. So I always encourage the students to actually make changes to the papers themselves. And of course, that's a luxury that we have in the Writing Support Center because we, we have students send their papers to us and, and we send them back with the understanding that they're going to make changes to those papers before submitting them for class. Um, but I think that that can be built into our feedback even for the final draft of the final paper that we do for a class. Um, you send it back to the student with the understanding that, that yeah, I want you to continue learning from what I'm giving you here. And so these, I'm going to give you questions. I'm going to give you directions. I'm not going to just feed you the answers here. Uh, and it's by, especially if you can set the table by telling them, them this ahead of time, it's by making those changes, even if it's just for yourself, that you're going to learn and you're going to improve. Uh, that, that action piece, that, that actually doing something is, is a really key component to this. Uh, and I'd like to, I, I talked, or I shared a few moments ago that, that I feel that my, my feedback has, has really evolved over the years. Um, 
going back from when I first started teaching ESL, EFL, uh, and then to my first job teaching uh, literature and writing, uh, and now to where I am both as a writing support staff member, writing support center staff member, and also as a writing teacher for, for CUCA. And I teach a couple other colleges too. As I said, my, my feedback has evolved, and, and I, I find that it takes a, a couple of different forms, or maybe three different forms, and I've described those uh, in three different ways here, and I'll show you some examples of them. Um, the first two are the examples that I think I, I, I try my best to stay away from. That's not to say that I always can or that I always do. I, I certainly um, err in both of these mistaken directions from time to time, too. As I said, it's a, a constant evaluation process to try to get better as a, as a, a teacher uh, and get better teaching my students through the feedback that I, that I leave them. Um, but um, anyway, the, uh, the first the first thing that I find that I do I do on occasion and did a lot more when I was uh, earlier on in my my teaching career was I left lots of feedback I, I described this above as my sharpened pen uh, and if you look here at this at this document you'll see that the marks that I've left on this paper probably outnumber uh, the amount of text that you see from the students uh, the student who wrote the paper in the first place all kinds of yellow here all kinds of red here that's those are all my marks that they they outnumber out overmatch the uh, the black that's there on the paper. Um, so that's that's kind of a flag in the first place. We've I've probably given the student an overwhelming amount of material to deal with here, an overwhelming amount of feedback. I don't know if I were to receive this paper myself, I think I would just be discouraged and, and not really know what to do with it. And if you take a closer look at, at something that's in there, I've, I've picked out a, a, a few lines from this. And this is the sort of thing that I did uh, on this paper. And I can't say that I'm immune to doing this from time to time now. Um, I've intervened here and I've, I've given the student better word choice of what I thought was a better word choice at the beginning. Uh, there in the middle line, I've deleted something and, and made the sentence more concise. And, and it may very well be the case that what I've created for the student is a better, a better sentence. But I haven't done the student any favors other than maybe help them raise the grade slightly. I haven't done anything that, that helps the student learn here. Um, I haven't given the student an opportunity to think about how you might approach this differently. I haven't given the student an opportunity to make any changes here. I've just handed the handed the answer over. Um, the other extreme, uh, and, and again, I, I, I try to avoid this one as well, but I can't say that I'm, I'm always successful at that, especially if I, I don't know what I'm doing for an assignment or what my students need to be doing for an assignment. Uh, is I've called this one my capped pen. This is where I don't give very much feedback at all, and the feedback that I do give is is not especially not especially directive or helpful or instructional. Uh, you see, glancing at this paper in comparison to what we had on the last one, there's there's not much here, and that doesn't necessarily mean that I've done something wrong. You can leave excellent feedback on a paper where you have just as many words as I've left here in these comment bubbles off to the right hand side. Having said that, what I've done here isn't especially helpful. It's sparse to begin with, uh, and if you zoom in on on the feedback that I have given here. Comment IP1 here so says interesting paragraph. It doesn't really tell my student very much. It means that I liked the paragraph, but it doesn't give the student anything to build on. If there's something that I found was especially interesting, I should be pointing that out to the student and, and so that the student can then can then build on that, can then do something similar in other papers or across this paper. Uh, in other words, it helps to be as specific as you can, at least on certain occasions, to be as specific as you can so that your students can actually say, okay, well, I've, I've done this well. This is something that I can do again, and, and chances are I will be doing that well again, and uh, do more and more of that. Now you scan down to the next comment that I have here, comment IP2, and it says you have a comma splice in the preceding passage. Well, there are a couple of problems with this. First, I think that most students wouldn't really know what a comma splice is. Some will, some will remember that from there their grammar uh, classes back in elementary school. But to be quite frank, I didn't really know. I knew what a comma splice, that a comma splice was something that you shouldn't do. And I knew it had something to do with commas, but until I actually had to teach writing uh, and specifically for CUCA. So after years of, of teaching writing and teaching in different contexts, um, I still didn't know until I got to CUCA, uh, long story short, what a comma splice was, what that, that specific problem was. So I've given the student a, a term uh, that isn't especially helpful here. I guess I guess that student could go out onto the internet and look it up uh, and try to figure out what that is, and then come back and, and see what what might be the problem here in this paper. Um, but then you reach the second problem with this comment, which is in this preceding passage. It doesn't tell the student where the problem is. There there could be multiple places where this has where this has uh, been a problem or where it's potentially an issue, uh, and I'm not giving any direction at all. 
Uh, and so I haven't really helped the student at all. I've made it a I've made it a treasure hunt for a treasure that the student doesn't especially want to track down, uh, and in all likelihood won't bother trying to track down. And I can't say that I would blame that student either. Uh, and then you look at the the end note that I've got for this paper too. I've said as you a good start on this as you revise your draft, be sure to edit for concision. Uh, also, so you misuse the semicolon in a number of places. Overall, though, you've done good work. Keep it up. It's encouraging, I think, that in striking an, striking an encouraging note is an important thing to do with our students. Uh, having said that, there has to be a little bit more specific here. I've told the student, again, I've shared some, some terms that might not be all that helpful. Uh, I know students, a lot of, of our students wouldn't know, and students in general wouldn't know what I mean by concision. I know that some students don't know what a semicolon is and how that differs from uh, a comma or a colon or any of the other punctuation marks that are out there. So again, I'm giving very, very vague feedback, not pointing out to anything, not pointing to anything specific and not giving any specific instruction. The medium, I don't know that it's a happy medium, but you know, like I said, it's one that I'm, I'm trying to find all the time, uh, is somewhere in between. Um, and you take a look at this example here, just scanning back, I'm sorry for the, the back and forth there, but just glancing at that first page that you see, uh, to the left, um, there's a lot less feedback than there was on that first one, uh, and there's a lot more feedback than there was on the second one. So in that sense, it's a little bit more of a balanced document than what we saw in the previous two examples. Uh, and then scanning in here, uh, the feedback that I've given here is <clears throat> makes a point of building on itself. Or I, I try to do that across the paper. So you, you look at that first blue arrow that's up at the top left there, and I've pointed to the word precept. And I've given the note, don't capitalize this. I've told the, some, the student something very specific to do here. Uh, I haven't made the ch change for the student, so that student's going to have to go in and change that P at the beginning of the word. Um, I don't think that this wound up being the case in this particular paper, but um, if that word came up a little bit later in the paper, I would just highlight it. I wouldn't give the, the note again. Uh, so I'm, I'm making the student refer back to what happened earlier in the paper. In, in other words, trying to train the student to to actually remember these things uh, across a document and across all the documents that, that I review for, for that student <clears throat> so that these things can build across a paper. Uh, and we really do hope that hope for that both uh, in the classes that we teach and uh, in the work that we do for our students at the Writing Center too. We hope that what we're getting is uh, our students learning from the mistakes that they make and we're encouraging them to learn from the mistakes that they make within that document and then ideally to take those those same lessons forward to the other things that they do, the other work that they do for in any class, all the classes, all the writing that they have to do. Um, uh, so you see here a little bit lower down on that page, uh, I've pointed out in comment IP1, this points off to the right hand side now, uh, that the student needs a needs a comment, excuse me, needs a comma, and I've pointed to the spot, it's a little bit coming in a little bit dimly at least on my screen, but that's where you see the uh, in the middle of the page off to the left there, the, the blue highlighted section that says staff but, there needs to be a comma there. I haven't gone into a detailed exp explanation there, but I've, I've told the student that it needs to be there, and I've given the, the student a link to information where you can get, a, get some explanation of why that is, why it is that you need a comma there. Uh, if a similar comment comes up again, and it does one line down, I've just highlighted the issue. Uh, you see there, this and, uh, let me pull my cursor up here, um, my mouse up here, this and, and then I've pointed back to that same comment that I did, that I had just left a, a, a couple lines above, see comment IP1, so the student knows what the issue is, know where, knows where to go for information on that that issue. Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm trying to make this feedback build across the document. Uh, and I've left a, a little bit more feedback here, let me see, what, what was the comment that I was pointing to here? Oh. Uh, comment IP2 is a problem with the period. The period's in the right in the wrong place. It should be that the period comes after the citation. The student's got it before that. Uh, that's one that co comes up again on the very next page. Uh, at the very top of that page, you see the um, the first highlighted space is that period, which should be at the end. In fact, the student has both has periods in both spaces here. But I've already left a note about that. I'm not going to leave a comment again. I just highlight it. Uh, and I don't think I do this in this document, but uh, one thing that I'll do across a lot of papers. If I see this this problem again, in fact, if I were to review this paper today, um, what I'd do in this this final spot right here is say, I'm going to stop marking this problem now, be on the lookout for it, uh, so that the student knows that this is, reading the rest of the paper is uh, is not just a simple matter of doing all the things that I said to do, it's, uh, it's also involves, excuse me, it also involves careful reading, also involves uh, doing this this revision work, this proofreading work, 
carefully on my own uh, and that the writing center or my teacher is not going to do all that work for me. Uh, here about midway through the document I've left a little bit more uh, of a detailed comment. I've left some encouraging words and also uh, given some specific instructions on how to, how to make something specific um, a little bit stronger in the paper. Uh, it's much more detailed than that end note that I left on on the, that previous paper, the one that I, I showed uh, just a moment ago, the, the capped pen paper. Jumping over to the next page, uh, precepting, I was wrong, precepting does come up again. You see I've just highlighted that. Uh, the period comes up again. Um, and then this is something that I'll do I'll do at the end of a lot of papers. I Even when I'm reviewing a rough draft for a student for a class that I'm teaching, not, not with their final draft, I, I read those all the way through, but um, what I'll often do is, is stop somewhere in, my paper, in, in the student's paper and say, uh, I'm going to pause here to give you a chance to work on the issues that I've highlighted as you're doing that. Um, make sure that you're, you're looking for these same issues across the rest of your paper. Chances are that they repeat. Uh, so you'll want to you wanna read for those carefully. Uh, so again, I'm encouraging the student to, to learn from the things that I've, I've pointed out, uh, to make those changes, uh, and then on top of that, to read actively for those same problems elsewhere. Um, and with luck, they're internalizing some of these, these uh, lessons as, as they're going through this process. All right, so that's a brief and maybe general overview of, of an evolution of my, feed, my feedback and, and of what I think a feedback, some of the qualities of effective feedback. But I think another really important aspect of this is starting with uh, the expectations that we're looking at. You know, I, that question that I, I posed to the interviewer um, when I went to that job interview a couple years back or several years back now, I said, I don't, I don't know how to grade. Well, you know, how do I, how do I grade? Um, and that, I think that at the core of what I, what I was asking and asking for guidance on was what do you expect of me? What do I expect of my students? What do my students expect of themselves, of the course? Uh, and we didn't really reach an answer in that interview. Like I said, the answer I got was, that's a good question. I'm still trying to figure it out, uh, which is, which is helpful in a certain sense, but uh, doesn't help us a whole lot. And I think that we can be a lot more specific about this. I think that we can maybe not boil it down to five or ten simple things that we're always looking for and that we can always count on, but I think that we can boil it down to a set of expectations that, that help us as we're grading and, and leaving feedback on our students' papers uh, and that help our students because I think it's it's important that our students know what we want from them. Uh, and um, it's by discussing what we expect openly with those students that, that they can hope to achieve what it is that we're, we're asking for, that we want to see from them. So I think that when we start looking for expectations, uh, we're, not, we're not just lost, especially, especially those of us who are working in ASAP, because we, we have a lot of things that are already available to us. But this, this goes beyond ASAP, too. A lot of, the, a lot of the, the sources for expectations that we can be looking to and grading our students on uh, and from uh, are, are really already there for us. So college guidelines, for instance, these are in our undergraduate and graduate student handbooks. Uh, and I've pulled out, pulled out a quote from the uh, ASAP uh, instructor reference. Um, and this one says, ASAP students develop marketable skills in critical thinking, writing, communication, presentation, research, and problem solving. Uh, you know, it seems pretty general, and it is, it is pretty general that we want our students to get better at critical thinking, writing, communication, presentation, research, and problem solving. Um, having said that, when I was first going into a class that I had to I had to teach and grade my students on, I had I really had no idea what it was that I was supposed to be looking at. Uh, I knew that it was a literature class, the, the first one that I was teaching, so I should probably be looking at uh, their writing in some way. But that was about it. Um, I needed something a little bit more specific, and this isn't super specific, but it's a little bit more. Uh, and if if I had known that something like this was available to me, I, I could have looked more at communication skills too, and and built that into the rubric for my class. Um, so college guidelines are a good place to start. All of our programs in, in ASAP, uh, management, nursing, um, social work, and criminal justice, they all have lear learning outcomes. And these are right on our syllabi. They're right there on every syllabi for all of the courses that we teach. It's a standard part of, of what we have on our syllabi. Um, and we have some repetition, uh, or I'd like to think of it as, as reinforcement of the ideas that we had uh, in the college guidelines there um, to demonstrate decision making and problem solving. Um, related to criminal justice issues. I've obviously pulled this off of a criminal justice um, syllabus. Uh, demonstrate critical, reflective, and analytical thinking. 
Uh, and I won't read all of these off to you. This this information is here for you. Um, but I, again, I think that these are things that, that are worth looking at. If you're kind of lost in the woods and not sure how to review your students' papers and how to how to point them in the right direction, what it is that you're supposed to be looking at, number two is a good one. Uh, or is what I'm seeing here in this in this paper reflective? Am I seeing analytical thinking from my student? Uh, or is what I'm getting here just sort of a, a regurgitation of, of what was in the literature? Uh, is the student adding something to this discussion of the issue that we're, we're going over in class? Uh, or is the student just repeating something that we already talked about in class? Um, so that that's another source for it. And just as we have program learning outcomes, we have course objectives and course learning outcomes too. Uh, again, I won't spend too much time here with this, but this this is where we start to get a little bit more specific uh, to each of the courses that we're that we're teaching, and I think it's really important. I try to do that at the beginning of each course um, with my students, return to those course objectives that we have, and, and tell them, look, these are the things that that are written right into the syllabus as most important, and these are the things that that we want you to focus on, and these are the things I'm going to be grading your papers on too. Um, these particular objectives that you see here are a little bit dated. The course has now been replaced by another course, and the objectives are more specific. Um, but nevertheless, uh, the idea, the ideas are there. Uh, we're looking for organization, for instance. We're looking for gra grammatical accuracy, uh, that these are the things that will be grading in their papers, too. And that, that helps me, when I establish that for my students, it helps me um, both know what I'm going to be reading for when I, when I read their papers, and it helps them to know why I'm reading for these things, why I'm, I'm marking grammar errors in their papers, for instance, why I'm looking at structure and organization of their papers, and why I'm I'm providing so much feedback on those particular issues. Uh, specific to each of the, the courses, excuse me, each of the classes assignments that we have are, are the rubrics for those assignments and specific instructions too. And they're very straightforward things. But we want to look at the very, did, does the student actually follow the, the letter of the law? Does the student actually follow what it was that he or she was told to do in the assignment description? And uh, depending on our program and depending on the, the course, a lot of our Assignments, specific assignments, have rubrics that are built into them. Some of them, some of our courses have rubrics that are built right into them for all of the assignments. Uh, and so these are things to to lean on as well as we're looking at the expectations. And whether it's ahead of the entire course, you know, maybe in that very first course meeting that you have with students, or you do it virtually if you're teaching in an online context, uh, or if you do this prior to each assignment, I think it's important to go over these expectations, uh, the specific ones and the more general ones, so that the students understand what it is that you're looking for, uh, and so that you understand and remember what it is that you're looking for. I think it's easy to get halfway through the review of a student's paper uh, and forget why it is that you were reading it, forget what it is that you wanted to, to tell the student, forget what it is your objective was, what expectations you had. You just start leaving lots of feedback on all kinds of stuff, and before you know it, you, you don't know where you are or why you're there. Uh, I think this is another. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we have a ahead, question. Um, sure. What's that? Diane asked, "Do you have any advice on how to make electronic review and feedback more efficient? I find it much more time-consuming to grade writing online versus on paper." Yeah. Well, you know, I the, the first time I did a version of this presentation was um, was at the instructor workshop in the spring of I want to say it was 2013. Uh, and uh, as it turns out, the, the part that we're not going to get to with this presentation right now is that piece. It's how to make your, your digital review of documents a little bit quicker. It's some of the shortcuts that you can use in Microsoft Word, for instance, uh, some of the keyboard shortcuts that you can use uh, to make, make your uh, feedback quicker and more, more efficient and easier to use. Um, and these are these are things that I've I've learned and, and built on as I've as I've gone through my time, especially in the writing center, and with all the opportunities that I have, I've to read student papers. I've had lots of opportunities to to get faster at it, and and I've needed to because we read a lot of papers. Um, so all that's to say that yes, I I do have some I do have some suggestions on that. I we're not going to be getting to that in this particular presentation right now, uh, but my hope is to to put together something that I could share with folks uh, in the not too distant future, whether that's another webinar or. Uh, potentially a presentation that I could share that would share some of these tools uh, with you. Um, I know that's a very general answer and it doesn't doesn't get into the specifics, but I guess the the takeaway would be uh, there are ways, and it is it is frustrating and it is a lot when you have lots of lots of students to deal with, especially or lots of students' papers to to read. Um, and I'll do my best to get something out to folks uh, in the in the somewhat near future um, that might help with that. Um, 
one one general yeah, thing. That I, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. No, go ahead. no. You finish your thought. Okay. No, I, uh, Kim Evanowski. Yeah. Has another question. Do you want to take it now or do you want to wait? Uh, okay. Kim writes. I encourage and allow rewrites to have students gain more perspective and understanding of their material and of their critical thinking, problem solving. Are others doing that also? I find that using a rubric has been effective to validate content versus grammar. Your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm on board with all of those things. I think that uh, especially especially the rewrite part. I think that what the students, I was talking before about leaving feedback that encourages students to make changes, to think and then to make changes. And, and it's through to giving the, the students the opportunity to do the rewrites that, that you really see that in action, that you see really see the improvement. Now, will every student take the opportunity to do a rewrite? No, no, certainly not. Uh, and will every student take all the feedback that we that we give? Nope, that won't happen either. But what you will see when you give students the opportunity to do feedback is is genuine improvement. And I think that that's a that's a, a really positive thing. That's in the writing course that we have. It used to be Com 320, and it's now English 300. That comes at the beginning of uh, three of the four undergraduate ASAP programs. It comes in management and uh, social work and criminal justice. Uh, that's that's actually built right into our course. That students have to do multiple drafts of each of the major assignments that they do for the class. And that's that's uh, partly because we want to see them improve across um, across the course. We want to see that and so that they can build on it and, and be encouraged by it themselves. But it's also so that they see, you know, even if a rewrite's not built into my class, maybe it's something that would be worth me trying to do on my own, whether it's by handing my paper off to a friend uh, or by handing my paper off to the writing center to get some feedback. It actually does get better when I when I make an effort to put more than just the night before the, uh, the assignment was due into my, my paper. Uh, so I think that that's... Uh, I think that that's an excellent idea. Uh, as much as it's possible, I think it's a, it's a wonderful thing to do with and for our students. Uh, to the point of rubrics, yes, I think rubrics are, are fantastic. Uh, I, I you know, touched on that just a moment ago very briefly, but that's when I'm reading papers for the writing course that, that I teach for, for CUCA and, and really for any course that I teach for uh, for CUCA, that's the very first place that I go uh, is, is the rubric. Um, these are the expectations that we have for our students. Uh, and this is this is what I should be grading my students on uh, for the writing course English 300. We happen to have a, a pretty detailed one that breaks um, the points for different different areas of writing, uh, breaks down the, the, the grade into different points for, for different areas like structure and grammar and APA uh, adherence to AT APA guidelines, for instance. And and by just falling back on that, I can always I can always point out what it is to my I can point out to my students what it is that they've done well, what it is that they can improve on it, and why. It's it's right there for me. So I think that, yeah, absolutely, rubrics are, are uh, I think that rubrics are fantastic. Uh, otherwise, you, you get into that place where I was with uh, when I was teaching and, and grading the first time, and I, I could tell that my students weren't writing A papers, but I couldn't explain why. Uh, and I could tell my students weren't writing, weren't writing F papers. I couldn't explain why. It kind of felt like the grade was coming out of thin air, and... Um, it's not surprising that students would question that. Not surprising that they would wonder why it is that their paper, their, their grade doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, and, and rubrics are a great way to um, avoid that issue. Were there any other questions, Deb, or should I finish up here? No. Um, Kim just said that she agreed with you. You'll discuss. Um, they will discuss more areas of writing with her using okay. that. Yeah. We're yep, good absolutely. right now. Absolutely. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, just wrapping up here with uh, the idea of expectations and setting those for students. Um, what I like to do is not only not only point to what's in my rubrics, uh, not only point to uh, what it is uh, that we have in the in the syllabus, but but the things that come up in class. Uh, as I said, I teach the writing course primarily uh, for CUCA, and so what what I'll identify over the the course of a you know a, a five or eight week session with students is that the specific to my group are, are these specific set of problems. Um, maybe they have problems with those semicolons that I mentioned before. So I might, I might actually have a section of my class or a section of a single class lesson uh, set aside for learning the difference between the semicolon, the colon, and the comma, uh, and all the other punctuation marks that you want to throw into the hopper. Uh, and so that I, we would talk about that in class. We'd, we'd have a, a discussion of it. We'd have a study of it in class. We'd have an opportunity to practice. Chances are that if they also had a paper due that day, I would also say, now, go back to that paper that you, after we've done these practice exercises, go back to that paper that you've brought into class with you tonight, and I want you to look for these issues as well. 
uh, and, and see if you can't revise um, your paper, not based on what we've just learned here for the last half an hour. Uh, and I think that it's important to hold students accountable for those sorts of things. And it, I've pointed to punctuation issues, but but it doesn't have to just be punctuation or grammar. It can can also be to the ideas that we discuss in class too. You want to you want to hold students accountable for uh, the concepts that you've presented in class that you've discussed at length in class uh, as well. Uh, you want to be transparent about that. I think it's important, as with any of these other expectations that we're talking about, that you establish these for your students. That you you tell them this is what we're going to be doing. Um, these, this is what I'm going to be on the lookout for, and, and so that they know that you're that you're going to be doing that. But but I think that those are those are absolutely things that we should be looking at as well. Uh, and then again, specific to uh, AP, excuse me, to ASAP classes or APA guidelines, we've got those to fall back on. Um, <clears throat> that one gets a little bit a little bit tricky when we just talk about APA guidelines in general because there there are so many of them. Uh, our students and a lot of our instructors come to our classes with a different level of understanding of APA guidelines. Uh, and so I'm, I'm going to leave that one right there and actually, rather than talk about APA guidelines, point you to the other file uh, that I shared uh, in the, the uh, document file sharing area part of this presentation. Uh, and that is a, a new document that we've put together recently that we're going to be sharing with all, all ASAP students and, uh, and faculty members. Uh, in the, the coming months. I'm not sure if it'll be during the summer or if it'll be by fall when we get this out, but uh, it's the ASEP um, style guide. Uh, and what we've done there is, is boil down some of the APA guidelines to uh, more of a checklist uh, that everybody can have, everybody can be responsible for. Uh, and it's not just APA guidelines, it's also about general, general writing clarity. Uh, we have a section in there on avoiding plagiarism, for instance, so that we can all be more or less on the same page um, about our expectations for avoiding plagiarism. Obviously, we want to all avoid plagiarism, but what it what it looks like, that's there in the document. Uh, there's a section on concision, I believe. Uh, so what are we looking for there? And so these are also, and again, there's a section on, on APA guidelines too. Uh, these are these are also, this is also a source that we can uh, visit uh, and return to with our students. And, and the, the thought with this style guide is that our students will keep it and our instructors will keep it and so that we'll all have it to refer back to as a, a common reference, something that we can be giving feedback on to our students um, and something that they can expect to be getting feedback on as well. Um, and I think that, that that just about wraps up my presentation portion of this. Um, and I, if anybody has other questions, I, I would certainly um, love to love to take them with you, take them from you. I see that we have a question here from Sunny Winstead about thoughts on peer critique. Um, that's a you know that that's a tr tricky one. I, I've had I've had peer critique in class go um, very very poorly, um, and I I think that well, Deb, what do you what do you think? What are your thoughts on on peer review, peer critique in class? For me? Yeah. Yeah. Are you asking me? I am. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it depends on the class, and I, de I think it depends on their maturity and if they have some sense of um, what the expectation is and if they're mature enough to be critical friends yeah. instead of, oh, gee, that's interesting, isn't that nice? Mm -hmm. So it really is so dependent on the class you're dealing with. Some classes just aren't, aren't up for it. No, I think you're absolutely right. I and think others do a fabulous job with it. They do. I, I think that that's absolutely right. The one thing that I found is that with those higher maintenance groups, um, is that you can sometimes make it a little bit more effective if you give them very, very specific things to be on the lookout for. If you just turn a group of, of students loose and say, um, I want you to give your, your classmates feedback on their writing, um, some of them will feel inhibited that they, they can't really, they don't feel like they're in a place to be able to offer f productive feedback. Um, that they, some of them will, will offer too much, and they might offend somebody too. Uh, so you get these these weird dynamics. But if you make it, if you make it a checklist, look here are the things that you're looking for. These were the assignment, um, these were the assignment outcomes, or uh, these were the, the specifics that we were looking for in the assignment. Um, do you see these in the paper? Do you do you actually see this? Uh, that's that's one way to get students on the right track, to give them something specific to be on the lookout for. Or maybe it's not something specific like that, but it's something that you think you want your students to be on the on the lookout for. Uh, what I'll often do in a peer review session with the writing writing students is take what the homework assignment was for that particular week. It's often a 
it's often a, a grammar issue or it's a structural issue with writing papers, and then say to my students, okay, we've got this checklist of things that we talked about in the first half of the class. Uh, we were going to be looking at uh, introducing sources. We're going to be looking at how you integrate quotations into your paper. What I want you to do now that you review your, your class-based paper is, is look at these things uh, specifically and tell me what do you think, how successful the student has been, uh, and, and if, there's, if it's come up short of the mark, why is that? Uh, so that we're dealing with, with something a little bit more directed. Uh, and so that it can be an answer that's not necessarily open and closed, but um, it's a little bit more yes-no than just what do you think? Um, or is this good or is this bad? I think that if we can point them in, in the right direction, we, uh, we set them up for a little bit more success. And for, uh, like I said, especially with those groups that, that need that, that direction. Some will just run with a, a peer review if you don't give them any direction at all, but uh, sometimes more direction helps a lot. Um, see. Jeff, can you read some of these questions about balancing grading content versus professional writings for seniors in the professional program? Okay, yeah, let me read that one again. Hold on a second. Grading content versus professional writing for seniors in a professional program. I'm afraid I don't I don't understand that last part, the professional writing for seniors in a professional program. Deb, Deb what do you take that to mean? Um, I take it, Diane, maybe you can uh, type the explanation. What I take it for is um, how much is the content of what they're saying worth versus how their writing is. You know, what's the balance there? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how you find that balance. Um, what, I, what I come back to with, with my students um, when I'm teaching a content course, for instance, I've, I've taught uh, business, business ethics a couple of times uh, for CUCA. But what I, what I, if the writing is, is so unclear that I can't get to the content, um, that's, that's a real flag for me. That's when the, the, the writing part of it overwhelms the, the content part of it. I think that the writing has to be clear enough to be able to understand that. And this could be my bias because I, I come from a, a, an English background, but um, I think that, that very often good, clear writing goes hand in hand with a good, clear grasp of the concepts. Um, that's not always the case. Of course, you can have st students who can't put the, the, the concepts into well-written sentences, but, but if what I, what I find is that very often bad sentences obscure the, the thoughts that the students have, and I, and I can't I can't get to the content unless we first clear up the clear up the writing issues. Um, so I guess I guess it's trying to find a balance between those between those two extremes. Can I can I understand it well enough to get to what that content is? I have a rubric I certainly... that um, I use as a general rubric. All right, I'm sorry, Jeff. No, no, please. I was going to. And ask it's anyway. uh, I break it down. I um. I break it down into 20% for structure and organization, 20% for grammar and APA, and 60% for content. For are, are they really addressing the issues of the assignment? And that's how I deal with that situation. And at least I have something that, that they know they're going to be graded on those other things, but content is really 60% is the majority of it. But as Jeff says, if, if there's no structure or organization, if it's not logical, it's not coherent, and grammar and APA is off, they're going to get knocked down sufficiently for it. Yeah, and, and I think that with a rubric like that, what you, what you might find, I think that makes a lot of sense. I like, I like that idea a lot. I think that uh, what you might find is that if the grammar and the, and the structure are bad enough, uh, the content's not going to come through anyway, and, and you, wind up, you wind up losing some of the content that, that ought to have been there in the first place too. So um, yeah, I, I think that setup makes a lot of sense. How about Kim's um, question? Can you see that, Jeff? Or would... Yep, just, just getting to that one now. I'm interested sometimes to see what students have written in the past. Do we encourage a portfolio that can be shared? We don't. We've talked about that, but we don't. I think it, it's actually... Deb, do you do that in management? Is there a portfolio in management that you, that you keep? There is a portfolio in management. Um, and if John can hear us, he might be able to, to uh, chime in with the availability of that portfolio for other instructors because in every assignment the students have the option if they want to download it to their portfolio and I'm encouraging students in the classes, I'm just starting a new cohort in Psych 301 to download um, certain documents, their vision and their mission. I think that's something that they should carry with them throughout the whole program and to see their own growth and maybe one of their initial papers 
just again to see their growth in writing. So, John, can you hear us? Um, yeah, the current version of, uh, of um, Moodle has bundled with it uh, the Mahara portfolio. And uh, it is turned on and it's active. Um, however, I believe there's a few steps that have to happen in order to make it available to uh, uh, a classroom. And uh, unfortunately, James is the expert in that, and he's not on this call. But uh, there's also conversations going on across the campus about, uh, you know, is Mahara the best portfolio we could use? Are there other things out there that might uh, might make more sense? And uh, so I think at some point in the hopefully not too distant future, there's going to be a campus-wide decision made on this. Uh, short term, though, if anybody's interested in, in uh, using it at the department level, um, you know, we'd be happy to talk to them and uh, implement it. Uh, Diane and John, you might be able to help with this as well, is asking if we have a depository of rubrics that can be shared. Um, not that we certainly could. Um, if uh, people would like that, we can set up a Moodle page and uh, password password protect it for faculty and um, and make uh, you know organize it however people want to. Uh, I think it's a great idea. There are, I'm writing there are it some, down. Deb, I'm sure you're familiar with these two, and, and correct me on the name, but the the value rubrics are they from the uh, the AACU? Um, um, I, I'm not sure where they're from, but, but there are second, they're secondary, there are higher education rubrics. Sometimes I find that they're so generic that they're hard to um, specify for each of the different assignments. And I yeah. tend to do one for each of the specific assignments, but that doesn't mean that mine are wonderful, but um, I think that would be a, a good idea. Yeah. So I wrote it down. Do we have any other questions? I see Fred is typing. Yeah. Jeff, at some point, would you be willing to do some kind of follow-up with what was asked about before with um, making the digital work quicker? Sure. Sure, yeah. How, what form would you like that to take? Would you like it to be uh, another webinar? or? Um, I, I, I think like it's something we can talk about. Yeah, I think so. You know, the good thing right. about the webinar, yeah, the good thing about the webinar is that it can be um, taped for posterity for anybody to watch it at any at any point. So that's something we can talk about um, later in the week. Fred does have a good question. I sometimes struggle with consistency between papers. For example, so I feel I'm sometimes too easy on early papers reviewed and then tougher on later ones. What can I do to be fairer? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I would say that having that awareness is um, the awareness that, that you can be different on different papers is uh, that you, you might treat the writing differently on different papers is uh, is an indication that you're you're aware of what you're doing and, and probably fairer with your students than than you than you you might think you are um, yeah, as far maybe. as yeah, go ahead, John. Maybe if you uh, maybe if you broadcast that to your students ahead of time that you know you're tougher on later papers than earlier papers, you might uh, give them an incentive to turn the papers in on time. Yeah, because you know sometimes there's good reason to be tougher on a student's tough, tougher on a student's paper later on uh, or or earlier on. It it can vary from class to class, and um, yeah, it, it, uh, again, it's it's one of those things that you stay on top of, try your best to stay aware of, and stay on top of. I'm sorry, Deb, I didn't mean to cut you off there. You know, no, that's okay. Um, I find that I'm a little bit easier on the earlier papers um, and get tougher. And I get tougher because if they keep making the same mistakes that I've already corrected them on, that, that is really bothersome to me. Because how many times do we say the exact same thing for five weeks about you've got this issue and then it keeps going and it doesn't get resolved and doesn't get resolved. So if I don't see growth, and I see the same patterns of problems, I get much tougher. And, you know, I think that there's a real, a real logic to it. That the, there's that piece of it, and then on top of it, you expect your students to to take the lessons that you're giving them. You expect them to learn from what you've been doing in class, and 
And if their work doesn't demonstrate that, it, it makes sense that you would you would be harder on them, that you would expect more from them later on in a course than you would at the very beginning. Um, everybody's feeling things out at the very beginning. We don't we don't know that at the at the, at the very beginning where we all stand, but. Uh, you expect them in week five to be responsible for the content you learned in weeks one through three, weeks one through four. Can you read uh, Kim's comment and question, Joe? Yeah, I'd, I'd be interested in having further webinars on different type of writing projects that would increase my students' ability to stretch themselves. Um, they tell me they get tired of the usual paper review. I use reactionary papers versus, say, a review. Do others have ideas to shake it up? Jeff, what thoughts do you have on that, the different assignments that we can give to, to stretch our students? Um, you know, it's really difficult when you're in a lockstep program and the syllabus is laid out and you don't have a lot of um, leeway with what the syllabus is saying that, yeah. that this is what they're going to be graded on. So I really have not been shaking it up. I've been following the syllabus as outlined by the, the management program. Um, I think that's a bigger question for curriculum development um, mm -hmm. and speaking to those that do write our syllabus to talk about can we do some alternate things because I think that this is a program that's based so heavily, at least management, on writing and mm -hmm. if the students struggle with writing, it's a long, hard task for them. Mm -hmm. Sure it is. Are there any other questions? Um, Diane had an interesting comment. She gets them to reflect on their field periods for a particular topic. What types of clinical decision makers did you see? How did people make their decisions? Which is also a great um, tie into systems thinking and leadership and ethics. And uh, boy, you could tie in so many things with that kind of observation and writing. Mm -hmm. Hey, Jeff, do you have any final comments or any kind of summary? Um, yeah, sure. Um, I guess I, I would recap by, by stressing those, those points that I, I laid out at the beginning. Uh, the first is that this is, this is something that we, we keep working at, we keep struggling at, just as our students are struggling in the class to get better uh, at writing and get better with the content. Um, we keep doing this as, as instructors to, um, like I said, I've, I've read thousands of papers for CUCA alone and my feedback I like to think it's on a you know and on a on an upward trend that it's getting better and more effective but I know I, I have moments I've had moments this week where I've given students back papers that um, I didn't do my best work on um, but that, that awareness is the is a really important piece of this that that you're aware of the work that you're you're doing uh, like that sensitivity that that sensitivity that Fred pointed to a little little while ago about um, feeling as though you might be a little bit more easier at one point, a little bit harder at another point, and how do we, we deal with that? You know, this this self awareness is a really important thing. Uh, and then, you know, just to to hit on those key points in the, the presentation again, um, it's important that we encourage our students to to work at it. And as long as we're giving them thinking work, critical thinking work, and we're giving them uh, an opportunity to actually practice with these things that we expect from them, um, they're going to get something from our courses. It might not be the perfect course, it might not be the perfect lesson, it might not be the perfect uh, feedback that we're giving to them, but as long as those pieces are there, as long as we're encouraging them to think and then to act, um, they're going to be getting something from that. And I think that we make it all the more effective if we can establish more or less clear expectations for our students uh, and for ourselves. Um, and we we come out we come all come out ahead as long as we're we're doing these things. It, like I said, we're not we're not going to be perfect. We never will be perfect, but uh, everybody's going to get something out of the process if if we're making our our best efforts to to do these things. And uh, just to and I would one, think that, more, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, you go, go ahead. ahead. No, no. My my last <laughs> plug was just for the writing center. Um, was just to to tell students to to come to us um, as much as that's yeah. convenient to them and possible for them. Uh, it, it helps. So I was going to say that as long as we see growth, that's what I want to see. You know, they come in and some of them have really horrific skills, and if I can see growth and that they're making an effort to improve, I'll work with them to, as long as the day will, will let me. Um, but it's, it's, it becomes annoying when they don't put forth the effort and they don't, they don't try. 
Um, but I think I, the key for me is seeing growth. And I think that Jeff, your comments tonight hit home setting expectations and how to help and when to help and steering them and being guide on the side. So I, I think that that was really important to remember. Um, Diane does have another question. How does the feedback to students from other ASK office student workers compare to the staff? You know, I can't, I can't speak specifically to the, the ASK uh, office student workers because I, I'm working on the, the ASAP side. I don't really know the ASK uh, student worker. Actually, I've never met any of the ASK student officers. I, I don't know much about their, their training process either. Um, I, I could speak more generally to the, the kind of feedback that we, we would give across, across programs in management, for instance, or uh, across all of ASAP. And, uh, to an extent, there's going to be variation, um, no matter who who we're talking about. The difference, there will be differences in the feedback. Uh, I don't think they would be huge, but there'd be differences in the feedback that I would give versus the feedback that my colleague Catherine Agar would give to to ASAP students on their writing, uh, just because we're all bringing our all own individual um, preferences and I think to an extent biases and expertise to the to that process. Um, so uh, I think we can expect there to be some variation regardless. Um, as far as the, the ASK office specifically, I'm afraid I don't have much of a connection with the ASK office at the, at the time being. Jeff, if um, encouraging students to submit to the Writing Center, what's the turnaround? I mean, if they have a paper due on Thursday, when should they get that to you? You know, we, we tell students that we'll give their, their papers back to them within 48 hours. Um, we're usually quicker than that. Um, but you know, on, on occasion it'll be it'll be 48 hours. Uh, so if a student if a student needs to, and it's important to keep in mind too that when the paper comes back, the student's going to have work to do because we don't make the changes for them. We we tell them that they have some changes they need to make and point them in the right direction in that regard or in that regard. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so if that paper's due on Thursday, yeah, you should probably have it in by Tuesday morning. Uh, that that would be the best. Even better to have it in on Monday. Um, but uh, sometimes you can get away with with quicker than that, but if you're really planning ahead, plan for, plan for two days. Um, Fred, would it be out of line to require, to require students to submit their papers to the Writing Center? Well, before I respond to that, Deb, I want to hand it over to you and see what you think. I think it's fine. <laughs> and I know some instructors yeah. that do require certain papers to be submitted yeah. to the Writing Center, so I, I don't see anything wrong with that. I guess I would yeah, give Jeff no, and I, Catherine a heads up that I'm, you know, requ I'm requiring this set of papers to uh, be run by the writing center before they're submitted. Yeah, the, you know, it, whether it's instructors who do it, and that certainly happens. We have instructors who require their entire classes to su submit uh, an assignment, um, or it's the the program. Actually, social work has it built into a number of their, their courses, and I think nursing does too. Um, I'm not sure if you you folks do too in management, but have it built right into the syllabus for a course that. You have to have uh, your paper submitted to the writing center. That and submitting that document with feedback on it or some proof that you had your your paper reviewed is is part of the final submission too. That you you can't get for full uh, you can't get full points on the assignment without doing that. So yeah, we we certainly appreciate the heads up because especially when we have uh, several courses that are similar running at the same time or several courses of cohorts running at the same time with the the same class and the same assignments, it can get kind of overwhelming for us, but. Um, we certainly will do our best to give those papers back to students and wouldn't hesitate to recommend that, that you requ require your students to submit the papers. Are there any other questions before we thank Jeff and uh, call it a night? Jeff, I just want to thank you um, on behalf of everyone. This was really informative. We appreciate the time that you put into preparing this and uh, taking the hour to spend with us to to help us with our feedback. Oh, and I think you pleasure. can read the my comments. Pleasure. Everybody's saying it's been great. I, you're very welcome. And um, don't hesitate to, to reach out if there's anything that, that any other questions that you have. Um, my email address is, I can type it in there. Um, Glee. It's Glee. Yep. There it is. Um, that's my email address. Don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions uh, or any if you could use a hand with anything. Um, and again, don't don't hesitate to ask your students to reach out to us as well. Happy to help. Okay.
Great. I think, John, that's a wrap. Thank you all for attending. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thanks, John. Take care.